Hello all, welcome to this files and audio webinar and thank you for joining. My name is Bas Hoxberg and I'll be presenting today's webinar. My colleague Ryan Sainsbury is available in the background to help out where required. Um, I expect this webinar to be about 45-50 minutes, uh, so slightly longer than normal. If you have any questions, please use the buttons at the bottom of the screen to get in touch. We might answer the questions on the fly or at the end of this webinar. I see a nice list of attendees and hope we can make this interesting for all of you. Um, so in today's session, we'll talk a bit about audio in relation to virals. And from this, we'll give several examples. Um, the way how we see audio might not be always 100% correct. Um, you'll see what I mean with that in the next slide. Um, but we try to make it clear for people who ask us, yeah, what does virals do with audio to try to cover all those topics? Um, Due to the nature of this webinar, there is, of course, sometimes audio in this webinar. If it is too loud uh, in comparison to my voice, please let me know via the Q&A section or via the chat window. I'll try to adjust it. So let's talk about audio. And I'm going to mention this audio related. And why do I mention it like that? Um, audio is, of course, normally you know an audio wave. And music is, I guess, the best example. Um, but we hear sometimes that when people ask us about audio, they mean all types of things. So let me further explain that. Um, sound effects, you know, just like music, I think that's pretty obvious. An MP3 file, a WAV file, or something like that, something that creates actual audio, the most common ways of, um, uh, of audio and, and actual audio. But there's also something like this, which is called timecode. And timecode is... Um, it's a square wave distributed via audio system. So is it actual audio? Well, it should not be used because uh, if you do, it's going to sound something like this. Um, but why might people want to use this? There's actually a meaning of, of this. You know, it's not intended to be listened to, but it is sharing an audio um, via audio. It's sharing time information and every you know, every noise you hear, every frame, uh, 25 or 30 frames per second, it is sharing the exact hour, minute, uh, second, and frame. It is, um, well, it's, it's identifying that. Note that um, at this moment, I'm playing a WAV file as time code. That's not really the normal case in a normal situation. Um, time code is generated by, by an actual time code generator. Um, but the cool thing is you can just jump back and forward and it will always tell you the exact time a system should be playing back. Um, there's actually different versions of time code um, all with their own special characteristics. That's outside of the scope of this webinar and we'll just keep it generic to time code. Um, now, there is also something called MIDI and MIDI, to, to put it simple, it is used a lot in the, by musicians, but it is commands being told to other devices within the audio scope to actually create the real sound, to create the actual audio. So for example, if you press a key um, on the MIDI keyboard, it might send, you know, note 60 has been touched with velocity 10. There is an actual other device that makes it into a sound, you know, as if a key C4 on the piano is pressed gently. So MIDI are just commands, but they happen to be used a lot in the audio world. There's also a Ethernet variant of this, so MIDI over Ethernet, and to put it simply, that's called OSC. Now, within the MIDI world, there's also um, a form of time code called MIDI time code. Um, I can't let you hear that, but it's equal to the time code I just showed you. It is a protocol that is sending time across a network, but rather than sending it across the audio network, it's sending it across MIDI cables. When talking about audio, there's of course also the difference between input and output of a system. And uh, we're now working with firewalls. Of course, we need to figure out, do people want to do something with audio in the designer software or do they want to do something within, um, from the firewalls hardware? Because if we look to a, a simple example, for example, uh, well, let's turn some of the blocks on. Um, if people want to use time code programmer show against output we are talking about getting 
time code into the system. I want to set it up from the designer and run it from the hardware. This is a, a valid request that we can meet. And I'll show you this in a second. Uh, but also something like this, I want to, uh, based on an OSC trigger, I want uh, the firewalls hardware to output out um, or I want to output OSC triggers from the firewalls hardware. This is something we can meet. And let's do one more. Uh, I want um, InDesigner to use music because I want to program show um, against a, a song. Yes, we can do that. Uh, but not all of the combinations I can make from this screen would be um, valid within a, a file system. To continue on these concepts, let um, I've, I've written up a list of different concepts that people are asking us from time to time. And um, very well, Sometimes the question is quite simple. Do you do audio and only, uh, or do you integrate with music? And only when we start to ask, we understand what people actually mean. And the reason why we ask that is because it's quite important to understand. Um, at high level, I could split this up in two different sections. Um, the top one I'm calling show control. So trying to make a nice show that might include some sort of audio and lighting that where, um, where I want to play the exact same effect every day uh, on end, or I maybe want to do, um, you know, be sure that if somebody walks through a sensor, the right piece of audio is being recalled. So everything having to do with show control, as you see in um, um, sound and light shows or in themed entertainment or areas like that. At the bottom end, we have more um, items that re require, let's call it music processing. You know, if uh, sometimes people ask us if we can play another show based on the type of music played. So they actually want to take a piece of music, do processing on it, determine if it's electronics dance music or if it's uh, rock or if it's whatever classical music, and based on that, play back a show. Faros is all about show control and everything related to music processing is, is not something that we can do. I mean, we can integrate with other systems that can do it, but we don't do it ourselves. Um, some of these parts that are exactly at the edge, I mean, it's literally a gray area, hence putting the gray block uh, behind it. Yes, we can do some parts of this, but if it's meeting your project requirements, that's difficult for us to judge. I will give examples in this webinar of the things we can do, um, and if this is sufficient, based on project by project, you can probably decide that yourself, or you can let us know, we can try to, to help you make that call. Um, I'm going to take you through these examples. I'm gonna show you how this is set up in, in Farrells. And the first part is related all to the, the Sun and Lumiere shows. Um, in that case, the setup is quite simple, right? There There is a, a lighting installation and people want to program a nice show against music. Um, we can do that and we can do that relatively simple. Um, the cool thing is for this, you only need the designer software. You don't need any sp uh, specific hardware. It outputs just via your computer audio. And this is just a convenient way to create, um, yeah, to, to create um, a show. Um, I've started already with a project file. Um, there is a layout in here. Um, the timeline is still completely blank because this is where I want to create an eye show, but I'm gonna jump directly to the simulate window. And over here, I'm gonna click this little tick box called enable simulation audio. If I now go back to the timeline, you see there's an additional row on my timeline. And over here, if I go to the media tab, I can now import songs, MP3, WAV files, things like that. And I can put these on the timeline just as you're familiar with doing it on, on other presets. Um, I have the ability to adjust the exact start or stop time so I can skip an intro or an outro. Um, and of course, I need to add the duration. In this case, I'm just going to make the length of the clip the same as the uh, original song. Um, if I now play, we simply will hear the audio track, as simple as that. Um, I can mute it via the button on the top um, or unmute it again and, and like that hear the audio. I have the benefit that I can, let me make the audio a bit softer. Um, I have the benefit that I can just jump to the right position on the timeline and it will start to play that instantaneously. So very simple to um, over and over repeat the relevant elements. 
there we go. Um, now let me put some effects on this timeline. And to start this, I'm just gonna make some very short uh, red flashes that last about half a second fade in, half a second fade out. Um, and I'm gonna put them at the beat, so to say. Uh, I know the first one was at the beginning, so that was pretty simple. Uh, the next one was about about two seconds later, I think something like that. But you see, I have the the wave curve at the bottom of the screen to figure out um, what is exactly happening. Um, and as you might see, I'm sometimes zooming in or out. I can do that either by adjusting the cursor on the top, but I can also by uh, do it by holding the right uh, shortcut button, uh, which is shift, if I recall correctly. I'm not, this is a recording, but I'm pretty sure it is shift. Otherwise, play around, you'll find it. Um, like this, I can put all the different presets uh, at the right moment. I can play it back. And I think, yes, this is indeed, you know, this sounds right. I can see that the waves, it's matching up, um, or I can simulate it over here. And we see the lights turn on at the right moment in time. Now, of course, I don't um, need to use just, you know, simple blocks of color. I can also use the dynamic effects and, and make that link up. Let me use a um, the wave preset. And I want to make all those same fixtures just uh, flash on in white and then slightly fade to blue. To do that, I'm gonna uh, adjust the, the wave properties. So I'm gonna put it to ramp down. There's 36 fixtures in this group. So I'm gonna make the buddy, um, uh, I'm gonna make the, the buddy to 36. Um, yeah, so that starting point seems to be more or less right. Um, I'm going to change the, um, uh, the rest of the timing to make this line up. And because you have the waveform at the bottom of the screen, um, it, it's pretty straightforward. Again, let me reduce the audio a bit to set it roughly the same time. And then by zooming in, you can um, make it match better. Uh, a question that just dropped by is um, if we can enlarge the sine wave any further. Uh, unfortunately, we would love to do so. We might in a future version, uh, but it's actually quite a lot of work. and. Um, at this time being, this is the, the waveform as we support it. But you'll find out in most of the cases, if you zoom in, it will give enough detail for you to program against. Um, so I adjusted the rest of the, the preset. And um, because I have adjusted this preset and I found out you know, what the timings are, it's actually quite simple to now add additional effects to it as well. Because I know the loop time can be exactly the same because the beats, of course, are uh, yeah, once I know what the beat interval is, I can adjust um, multiple presets to, to have that same timing. Um, let me zoom in a little bit to be sure that the starting point of this effect is right. And on this one, it's maybe important to, to mention that when you move a preset over a timeline, by default, we are snapping at 0.10 seconds precision. But if I'm holding the shift key, I can position uh, presets within one hundredths of a second, so I can make it match exactly at the right moment in time. Let me simulate this. Oh, and turn up the music a bit. And in a second, we will get the additional uh, wave on the facade to enter. Oh, that was a bit further, I forgot. Um, normally, of course, if you have a, a larger screen, you can conveniently put, put two windows side by side. But in this case, in a webinar, um, that's kind of tricky. Um, yes, well, I think this, this gets the idea, right? Um, you just create a timeline, you put the audio at the bottom and you can program your effects against it. Of course, you can make multiple timelines all with uh, different songs, different shows, etc. Um, the simulation audio will only simulate one piece of audio at a time. So if you would make a soft trigger that starts three timelines at once and try to simulate that, it will only simulate the last uh, audio based on the last timeline that was started. Um, yeah, I mean, this is of course the basic, right? So I can put um, I can put audio on a timeline, but that helps to create a show, but in the end, you want to be sure that it's played back at the right moment in time. So let's look at the real first use case where you have a sound and light show and you program the night show against music, but now you want to make some triggering to, um, to make it link. Um, to do that, I go to the trigger page and 
at the trigger page, of course, you can say there there is an incoming system. It is just normal firewalls triggering um, that starts this timeline, right? Timeline one is the timeline that has my show. Maybe there are some uh, serial trigger coming in or some audio triggering coming in from an external system that makes us start the lighting. Um, pretty straightforward, I would say, the normal way from integration. Um, but there's also, of course, the other option. Let's say there is a, a trigger in our system and we want to both start the light show, but also send a trigger to the audio system. For example, a, a serial string. Let's say you do this and you go testing and you find out that every time when you send actually this output to the serial uh, system, it takes about one second for that audio system to start. So you need to bring the system back in sync. Of course, you can take all the presets on your timeline and move that one second later, but there's actually an easier way. You can just adjust the timeline offset. And if you do this, you see now this timeline is starting at one second in time. Um, um, and like that, it, it is synced. Um, it will be synced up better. Let me just put this back to zero. Um, but of course you can imagine this way of integration is not ideal. I mean, it, if you have two completely separate system, it's, it's hard to rely that the triggering goes at the right moment in time. So let me go to this second example. A very easy way to be sure the audio and uh, lighting is in sync is if you're using one of our 19 inch controllers. So the LPCX, the VLC or the VLC plus, those have a analog audio output. Uh, they also actually have a digital the SPDIF output. This allows you to program audio directly on the device. And at the moment when you start it, it will output both the light show as well as audio via um, the analog outputs. Let me show you how that looks. I go back to a similar show. I have my timeline, but as you can see, I have the simulate audio disabled, but I am working with a, um, a 19 inch controller, the LPCX in this case. I go to um, the project features and I make sure that I enable timeline audio. Because once I've done this and I go back to timeline, I get a similar row as I had before, but this is now resembling the audio output of this controller. Um, I take a piece of audio, put it on the timeline, similar like I did before. Um, and if I now would play back the timeline, make it a bit softer, if I now play back the timeline, um, it will output audio via the designer uh, system. Of course, that works on the simulate page as well. Um, I have the option to also turn enable simulate on. This will create an additional row, but that will probably cause for confusion. So this is actually not a very likely use case. Um, yeah, well, let me um, stop this. And um, just to show you if I would add another controller, because maybe you have a big installation that's covering a lot of different areas. Um, if I would do this, I would simply get another row of audio where I can program against for the other controller. Um, and of course that can be in, on the same timeline, that can be on different timelines, multiple options possible. Now, if you're programming, um, if you're programming on audio on a controller, you will note that there is actually, um, you don't need to worry about syncing anymore, right? Because if you go to your triggering, as simple as starting a timeline, when the timeline is started and it will play the lighting, it will simply play the output at the exact moment in time. Um, volume can be set like this, which is pretty straightforward. If you enabled audio, you will also have received this Z volume triggers that allow you to set the volume um, on the controller, or if you would enable the um, trigger, controller trigger edit, enable it to every controller individually. Um, another feature that you might have noted, um, if you're using really audio from a controller, uh, you have the ability to set the audio category. And we have two options to choose from, background and alert. And I think the names probably give it away. Let's say I created two timelines. Timeline seven is a background timeline with um, background music. And this timeline number eight is just a very short um, audio track in the alert category. If I make two triggers, 
one to start uh, the background and another one to uh, start this alert. I can simulate this and you will see that this alert will be played back on top of the background audio. Uh, let me show this. I start the background audio. And when I hit the alert, this will be slightly played on top of it. This is convenient for the simple, let's say a fountain or something like that, where you want to maybe have a background music and also say um, at real time, say that the show will start in five minutes or in two minutes, or you maybe want to um, um, have a sensor if people cross a certain line to play a certain alert. So our hardware actually has two audio players. You can play back one piece of background and one piece of alert uh, and one alert layer at the same time. Okay, um, this is a very convenient way to sort straightforward sound and light installations. But if it's really down to quality, you can imagine that a, a lighting controller that's able to output audio is not sufficient for those more advanced installations. And in those advanced installations where lighting and audio or maybe even other, other systems like fireworks or, or animatronics need to be aligned, in that case, people use time code. Um, as we can find on our website in the which controller do I need section, so under products you have a uh, which controller do I need section, there you can scroll down and can see okay I want to use time code if I want to do that none of our controllers support that natively but all of our controllers can do that by adding a Rio A to the system. How would such an installation look? I have a Rio A, I connect that via Ethernet uh, to my controller, uh, and of course, there needs to be some sort of time code generator that is connecting via audio. I connect to the audio inputs from our Rio A and I'm good to go. Let me show you how to set that up in Designer. Again, I have a simple show. Um, I, I still actually, I've you know, done some pre-work. So I use the simulation audio feature to simulate audio um, to the right show. But now I'm on site and I actually need to connect the hardware and make it link to time code. Um, I already found controller. I'm waiting till, yeah, um, designer also now found the remote device. I'm adding a remote device and this is being associated automatically. So I can see um, I have my controller and my controller has a remote device, which is the Rio A, which is currently online. In the properties, I am going to change um, to, to make the Rio A used in time code mode. And I'm selecting uh, the channel. I mean, audio, as you know, stereo has left and right. The time code signal can be on the left or on the right or on both signals, but you need to select one of them you want to listen to. And you need to select the bus you want to route to. Um, Faros is actually supporting 12 uh, time code buses simultaneously, um, but I guess you hardly ever need that limit. In many cases, one is sufficient. Then again, we have customers who actually use all 12 of them. If you're routing time code um, to a bus, you see at the bottom, you have these two options to regenerate frames or ignore jumps for amount of frames. Um, very simply said, this is allowing you to make sure that even if your um, time code signal might not be very optimized quality, you will still get very continuous playback. But in a um, uh, proper quality system, you should be able to just leave both of them at zero frames and um, run without any issues. Um, yes, I mean, I can change frames, but let me just keep them at, at zero um, at this moment. So if I upload this to the controller, um, I'm making sure the controller knows I'm connected to a Rio A um, and the Rio A knows I'm, I'm configured to use timecode. Uh, with that done, I can open from the menu on the top, I can open up our timecode viewer. And because I now actually am playing back, uh, or I have a time code generator that is playing time code, I can see the code that's being created. Um, and also when I jump on that time code generator, you see the jumps are correctly followed up. It also shows me what format um, of time code I'm actually using, um, which is convenient. I need that for setting up the, um, the timeline later on. Uh, let me close that and actually set up my timeline. Because if I go to the manage mode and I have this timeline selected, um, I can say the time source, I want to change that from internal. So from the internal clock from, um, from the, the hardware, I'm going to change the time code to my time code bus number one. 
I select the format, which is the similar as I, I showed it, I'm using at this moment. I'm going to make a very simple trigger to say when controller, when you start up, play back this timeline, and I'm going to upload this to the controller. Um, I'm turning off time code right now to show you something. Because if I'm uploaded this, you see the timeline is started. It says it's running, but the time is just static at zero. Why is that? The device itself is listening to time code, but at this very moment, I'm not sending any time code. So even though the timeline is you know, completely up and running, it's just playing back the frame zero because it hasn't received anything. Now, if I start time code, you see it will just start to play back the exact um, frames of the time code that is sending out. Um, and you might note that the time code I was um, using for this webinar was starting at two minutes and 15 seconds. And the timeline so far I programmed, I just programmed to start from, from moment zero. So at this moment, I'm not actually outputting anything. Uh, and let me show you how to adjust that. I'll go back to the timeline settings, open the manage window, and I'm gonna put my time offset to the right moment of time code. Um, why is that? Many systems don't support multiple time code buses or they have other reasons why it's convenient to program different shows at the same time code bus, but different moments in time. This particular show, so to say, uh, or this particular show element um, is, is being started at two hours, 60 minutes and 50 seconds. So I put that as my time code offset and I can, um, yeah, right now I'm sure that I'm playing back the exact moments that I wanted to play back. The other thing to note is that when you make a, a timeline set to timecode mode, you're now not longer programming in one hundredths of a second, but you're programming in frames. So you see, if I move this, um, the last digit on the time um, on the time bar is going from 19, 20, 21 to 24, and then back to zero again, because this timecode has 25 frames, zero indexed, meaning zero to 24. Um, so you really program exactly to the frame in this case. Um, I can of course still use simulate. Um, let me simulate this timeline. And of course, normally if you play simulate, um, I entered the time code offset. So now it will start to play from two minutes, two hours and 16 minutes, 15 seconds onwards. But I can also say, I want you to listen to the time source. When I'm actually connected to the Rio, um, Rio A hardware and it's correctly set up, I will have the ability to um, say, I want to listen to a time code setting. And now all the effects are showing are following the time code that is out there on the network at this moment in time. Um, the refresh rate as you show it in simulate is as our simulation, that's I think at 15 frames per second. So that's not at the same refresh rate that our controllers operate at, but it will be sufficient to get confirmation that you programmed um, it in the way how you want it to look. Um, yeah, so that's the basics of time code. Um, and again, for more professional installations, time code are really the way to go. Um, let me now go to MIDI because um, I'm going to keep this very simple, but I mentioned to you there's also this concept of MIDI timecode. And um, the benefit is that our LPC controllers, so the DIN rail controllers, they all have a MIDI input, so they can support MIDI timecode natively. How would that look? look? Well, as simple as that, um, but rather than going via an audio cable, there are these MIDI plugs that you can put directly into your Faros controller. And now it can understand, well, MIDI signals, and that means it can also uh, understand MIDI timecode. Um, actually, I have a few slides to show you how to set that up. Um, if I would use a Rio A, there's um, MIDI plugs on the Rio A as well. I can just in the MIDI section, select what time code I want to route the MIDI time code to. And of course, when I do that, I can choose again if I want to generate possible uh, frames in case of jumps or not. Um, if I want to set it up on a LPC, I simply select the LPC, go to interfaces, and in the MIDI section, I can, like that, link um, MIDI to a time code bus. The rest on timelines and simulations and everything, it works exactly the same as I showed before with the linear time code. Um, 
while touching on MIDI, as I mentioned to you before, MIDI are just commands that are being sent around and OSC are just MIDI over Ethernet commands that are being sent around. Um, you know, Faros is great at integration, so it means we are also good and, and have a lots of options to integrate with MIDI commands or with OSC commands on a network. Um, a simple example, right? I went to the list, I selected some MIDI triggers. Um, and if I select a MIDI trigger or a MIDI action, I can put them to the list. Um, the only thing that is slightly uh, different than what you might know from, for example, Ethernet triggers or serial triggers. We have a dedicated MIDI message builder that is allowing you to, um, uh, yeah, to say what type of message you would like to receive. Um, yeah, I think for everybody who has worked with Ethernet with uh, triggering files, um, especially if you use serial or Ethernet triggering, this will look pretty familiar. Uh, this is just a, a tool to help you build that message. But in the end, it's all about when files receives a certain message, do a certain action, or when we, re we um, based on a certain trigger, output a certain action. Um, OSC is integrated via our I/O modules. So um, enable I/O modules click download, search for the latest version of the OSC module and download this. Um, this is now available in your library. And like this, you can add one or multiple instances of OSC. Um, so right now I'm going to make three different OSC samples, all with different output ports and input ports that will all work parallel on a single, uh, single controller. When you're working with OSC, you will get input and output triggers um, available in your uh, trigger an action list that you can program, well, in, in similar styles as um, um, you could program any other trigger in our system. So right now I've covered um, some of it quite short, but I've covered the six initial topics. Um, I do want to take the rest of this webinar to do show you what is possible in this gray area. So I do want you to show what audio options um, Faros has to take in audio to the system and make effects based on that. Again, I will. Um, we, we are able to do things and that's what I will show you, but we are not able to do really music processing. So let's say something simple like, or what sounds simple like, um, uh, I want to detect the beats per minute and make my uh, lighting playback at that rate. It is not something we natively support. I mean, there are some ways to do it, but I would typically say if that's what you're looking for, there are better systems uh, for that purpose, or there are systems out there we can integrate with. Um, as a nice example, real-time audio processing is quite hard, but there is this um, external application on the market that real-time detects music and is able to send MIDI commands for every beat, bar, and atom. So, you know, every, let's say every, um, every beat, the main beat, which is typically every four or every uh, three beats, and the atom, so let's say like the hi-hat sound, uh, External device can do that processing, sending us OSC triggers. That's probably a much better way to get there. Um, uh, but then again, there are situations where just reacting to music is what you want to do. And let me start with a very um, uh, simple application. Let's say you have a stadium and people want that uh, in, uh, at certain moments in time, the intensity of the pitch lighting goes up and down with the crowd cheering. So with the amount of volume um, the crowd is creating. Of course, there is a, a um, audio system already available within um, the stadium, but we need to get that audio signal. So let's say, to, to say it's simple, the microphone, uh, we need to get that into our system. Um, to do that, we need to have uh, audio input in our system. Our boxes don't support it natively, but with the Rio A, we can do that. The Rio A is able to analyze volume in a very straightforward way. A volume is being analyzed into a 8-bit value, and we can analyze different audio bands. So let's say uh, the the um, the bass, the treble, and um, um, what is it? the bass, the mid-range, and the treble, and analyze how much that is available as an 8-bit value um, in designer. 
how does that look? Well, this is how we set it up, right? You have the audio. Um, audio is coming from an external system. And just know that you cannot directly connect a microphone to, to this system. There needs to be some sort of audio system in between. But again, in I'm pretty sure that if you have this type of applications, these audio systems will be available. We just need to be able to receive a signal from that audio system. Um, but let's go back to this example. Uh, let's say these white lights, I want to link up to the volume um, of, of the audio signal coming in. Um, in order to do this, I'm going to make a, a simple timeline where I'm um, where I'm going to first turn the lighting on, right? I select the lights and I make them come on to 100%. And then I want to make a trigger to play with the volume. Uh, let me first make a trigger where I'm going to start up this timeline. So on startup, it will start to play this timeline at 100%. And now I'm going to a network and I'm going to say that I want to use this Rio A in audio mode, not in time code, but in audio mode. We are able to support four audio buses simultaneously. Right now, I'm just gonna simply simulate um, or route this to audio bus one um, and upload this to the controller. Um, once I've uploaded this to the controller, I can just as with time code, um, I can go to the hamburger menu and I can open up a time code, uh, an audio viewer. If I open this, I can see a graphical representation of the, the audio that's coming in. And right now I am actually sending back a piece of audio. So that is what the Rio A is analyzing. What Faros is doing, and I'll just pause the input, but the volume is a value between zero and 255. Band number one is a value from between zero and 255, et cetera, et cetera, for all the available bands. And it's these values that we're able to use in Faros and either use in the triggering, what I show you now, or use at the, the time code, uh, at the timelines, which I'll show in a second. If I go to the triggering, I select the audio input trigger. Um, I want to, I select the Rio I want to use. Um, I say I want, well, which channel do I want to use? In this case, this is just uh, combined. And I say I want to use the volume. I have the option to select the peak signal as well. Peak signals go up quick and ramp down slowly if you might. Um, it's just a different visual result. I set this up that every time when this value changes in range, I want it to link to the master intensity of this group of white fixtures. Um, so I need to say the intensity is linked to variable one because that's the variable captured in this trigger. Now, with most of these type of triggering, I cannot simulate this in designer itself, but if I upload this to the controller, and I'm going to the web interface, uh, I can show you how it looks. The one thing I just want to show in between is um, in this case, there's a very big chance that I don't want to always control use the audio to control the intensity of this lighting. And at moments, I don't want to listen to the audio input. I just want to control the intensity manual. In that case, I also have an additional audio trigger that is allowing me to toggle the audio coming from the Rio uh, a completely off or on again. So, I mean, uh, a simple way to say, you know, please shut, shut up and don't send me any new information or please do send me all your audio information. Um, let me go back to what I showed before, upload it to the controller, uh, open up the controller's web interface. And if I now look to the whites, intensity, you can see that the intensity of this group is just moving up and down very quickly together with the volume of the music. Um, so the yellow bar over here. There is an other way, however, to use, uh, to use this to make more effects. And to do this, I want to use, um, or I'm, I'm going to create eight different groups. And you see, I have those groups created here. And I want to make a graphical equalizer on all of these eight groups. Um, to do this, we can sort this at uh, the first thing I need to know, of course, I'm getting in eight bands of audio. So I'm adjusting my Rio A audio setup to actually listen to eight uh, frequency bands or to calculate eight frequency bands. Um, and next, well, let me just upload this and actually show this, right? Right now we have eight frequency bands, but in order to link every band to a timeline, 
um, I can do this actually at the timeline settings. So how does that work? Um, let me just remove uh, this trigger because I don't longer need these ones. And let me go to a timeline. And if we go into the timeline setup, I have the ability to link the timeline source to the audio bus. And what this means, this will use the zero to 255 intensity from volume to set up the position on my timeline. So in this case, um, uh, I'm going to link to, to the, the base, so to the lowest band, and I have a 10 second timeline. If I play back audio, the position of the timeline will extremely fast very well, per frame vary with the intensity of bass uh, that is being discovered in the audio. Now, a wide timeline is, of course, a bit dull. So I created this other timeline. And let me show you and simulate how this looks. This is how this timeline uh, looks if I play it back with normal time. Right? It's a fading in of a green to red uh, gradient that's fading in from the top to the bottom. If I would now link this to my timeline setting, which is audio in this case, I will get an effect like this, which is one band of a graphical equalizer. Um, I have created not just one, but I've created eight timelines. Every timeline is linking to a different um, part of my uh, facade. And of course, I set up in the manage uh, section that every timeline is looking to a slightly different audio band, uh, one to one, two to two, et cetera, et cetera. And let me, yeah, so this one's looking to two because of this two group two. I make a trigger to start all the timelines at once. As you know, Farrells is able to play back multiple timelines at once. And if I'm going to simulate this, we now have a graphical equalizer. Why is that every piece of audio, oh, Every piece of um, every timeline is looking back to its own part of the audio, and like that, it's it's well simulating my computer, or if I would actually connect this in the outer world, it's outputting the relevant values. Let's make another effect. In this case, I have a rainbow background. Um, I'm putting some other timelines with a black with transparent effect, but I do the same trick. I make a whole bunch of timelines and I link those up to different pieces of time. Um, to the different parts of the audio. Um, I create a new soft trigger, which is trigger number two, effect number two. Effect number two is starting eight completely different timelines. If I'm simulating this, I will get an effect like this. You know, I have a rainbow going on the back and I now have these top positions moving with the music. One more example, um, I have created here nine groups of four. Uh, fixtures. And for every fixture, I'm creating um, a simple timeline where this group of fixture, this single group of fixtures is changing from one color to the other color based on the um, amount of, uh, based on the music played. I made a new trigger. I mean, this is on a different set of lighting. So I just decided to toggle additional timelines. Um, and if I'm now going to simulate, we will see an effect like this happening. And I'm going to pause for a second, have a look to the, um, the first three blocks um, and the base of the music, and you'll see how this starts. This is the intro of the music, no bass yet. Here we go with the bass music, and that's when it kicked in. Let me just replay that so we can see how it looks. And apparently, I didn't have the sound matching to it. Ah, here we go. Yes, with a little bit of sound now. And we see on the left top, together with the bass, the lights kicked in over there. Now, if this is sufficient or not for your project, that's something I can't judge. Again, um, all these audio triggering is coming as a as a additional benefit because Faros is doing um, all these time code buses and we're supporting linear time code. Um, but sometimes it can be nice to, you know, as mentioned in a stadium, do some additional effects or maybe um, at a certain moment in time, do some other um, fancy lighting. Um, just one more example, um, because it is possible to also use the trigger page. Um, over here, I made a very simple effect. And this effect, as you can see, it's only lasting half a second. 
it starts um, bluish and then fading out to black. So another way to use uh, time co uh, sorry to, to use audio input, I now made eight of these or nine of these timelines. I set up the triggering to say once I receive a lot of audio at a certain band and when it enters the range between 100 and 255. So when the audio in a certain band goes high, then start a timeline. Um, another way to use it, if I use it like this, uh, again, because I'm going by the triggering page, I will need to upload it to the controller, but I can show you how it looks on the web interface that right now, every time one of the audio bands is going above a certain threshold, it is starting that timeline to play back this very short timeline effect. Again, different ways to use it. Very often, it is a convenient way to just get, um, yeah, customers who, who want some dynamic but don't need um, anything extreme um, yeah, to help you out and make this um, deliver to your customer what the customer is looking for. So just to recap, when we're talking about Faros and audio, there's a whole set of different ways what audio can mean. When it comes to show control, so creating nice Sun and Lumiere shows, Faros has different ways how to make it happen for every budget, either two completely separated systems, playing back, out back, uh, out, playing back audio or sound effects directly from a Faros controller or integrating with professional systems via timecode. Um, when it comes to send out MIDI or OSC commands, Faros can do pretty much everything you want, probably. I mean, we, our integration is what we are known for. When it comes to reacting to music, yes, we can do some things, but really try to understand what the customer is looking for, um, because this can be a bit of a gray area. There are things possible, but it's not always easy to set up. And there are also some other elements, like um, you know, trying to real-time detect the genre of music or automatically creating a scene based on the beats per minute of the music or something like that. That's just not something that we do. Faros is about show control, not about real-time music processing. With this, I'm coming to the end of the webinar. And um, if there's any questions, this is the time to ask them. I mean, one question has dropped by, uh, we answered that. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions at this moment, feel free to ask them. Um, because otherwise, I mean, we have been on for about 50 minutes, we will be um, rounding down this webinar. Um, yeah, maybe good to mention, of course, if a question comes up after this meeting, you can always contact us at support at um, so we can help you out. And also if you have a user who wants to do something with audio, you understand what he wants, but you're not sure um, if Faros can do it or if it, you're better off maybe integrating with other equipment, just let us know via um, our support email because we'll be happy to help you out. Um, there's no additional questions coming in. Uh, so I think I'm gonna round up. Um, after this webinar, you might receive a small survey where you can provide feedback and suggest other topics for the webinar. That feedback is very much appreciated. We're really looking into it and see uh, what other future webinars we will be planning. Um, so yes, your feedback is, is very much appreciated. Um, yeah, well, I guess this is it uh, for today. Um, with this, I'll be ending this webinar. I'd like to thank you for your attendance and I hope to see you next time.